This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, good morning, and I would like to first start by thanking Aloy for the invitation so, and the opportunity to talk to you about the work I do in the lab. Today, I'm going to focus on one of the lines of investigation we have in the lab, which is in natural products. And I'm really glad to say that because of that meeting with Aloy um, when I joined Cornell almost six years ago, um, I couldn't fight anymore and said, okay, we'll work on natural products because I thought I was going to stop working on natural products. I, I did some work on natural products on my PhD and, I'm going, and postdoc, and I'm going to mention it today. But I thought, okay, I'm, that's going to be it. I'm going to move on to better and newer things. And then I'm back to natural products. And, and I think I'm very happy that I revisited uh, that area. So um, just a brief outline of what I'm going to discuss today. So I'm going to tell you about uh, what are cancer stem cells, specifically what is leukemia, what are leukemia stem cells, and um, the way I see what are the challenges on eliminating leukemia stem cells, um, the compounds uh, that we're using to target leukemia stem cells, the strategies we're using to deliver these compounds in, uh, in animals at this point, and all, another nat other natural products. So I would like to begin with describing what cancer stem cells are. And to me, the best analogy to think about is plants. Um, since we're talking about plants, plants is the best analogy. Well, not just plants, weeds. And uh, I guess you hear in Ithaca are more familiar with this view. Us in New York, we never see this. <laughs> so <laughs> I like to dream that that's what I would like to see. Um, so we typically see weeds in our gardens. And uh, they're annoying. We want our grass to be really green. So what we think is the best way to eliminate that weed is come with the um, with the weed whacker. It's not the weed whacker. With the lawn mower, and uh, the weed is gone. However, we all know if that that's not going to solve the problem. If we don't get rid of that root, that weed is going to come back and be there again. So cancer stem cells are pretty much the same thing are the root of the disease, is the root of the cancer, and we need to eliminate that cancer, we need to eliminate that root. So I specifically focus on leukemia, and in general, leukemia is considered a rare disease when it's compared to breast, uh, prostate cancer or breast cancer. It affects around 300,000 people in the US. Uh, it is estimated that around 54,000 people will be diagnosed with leukemia uh, this year. And it's expected that around 24,000 people will die of this disease. So what, leuke what, is, what leukemia comes from, uh, I would like to think, um, or not like to think, I would like to first describe the hematopoietic system so we can discuss leukemia. And, and the blood system is highly regenerative and to me it's, highly, uh, it's very fascinating because if you think about how many cells we're producing every single day, and I put this slide just as an example, because every time I look at this slide, I go, wow, it doesn't matter how many times I see it, but these numbers are real. And just as an example, 2.4 million new erythrocytes are made per second, per second. As we're speaking, we're just making tons and tons and tons and tons. And probably if we exercise, we're making even more. So um, neutrophils as is a most abundant white blood cell. <coughs> And five billion neutrophils are produced every hour of the day. And if you notice also the lifespan of these cells is very short. So to keep this highly uh, regenerative system, you need a very powerful cell that can maintain this every day. And this powerful cell is what we known as a pluripotent stem cell. The pluripotent stem cell is a cell that can give rise to both the lymphoid, uh, a lymphoid progenitor and myeloid progenitor. These cells has a very uh, high capacity of cell renew and can give rise to these progenitors that are more committed to give rise to mature blood cells. And as they differentiate into the hierarchy, the, the ability to self renew decreases. So you can imagine this, this has to be tightly regulated. So what happens with this regulation is um, uh, mutated or something goes wrong 
you stop making mature blood cells, and what happens is immature blood cells accumulate in the blood, and, and then this is what we call um, or known about leukemia. So leukemia is an accumulation of immature blood cells, and these are known as leukemic blasts. They could be of the myeloid system or the lymphoid um, uh, hierarchy. So then it will be the myeloid leukemias or lymphoid leukemias. My laboratory specifically focuses on myeloid leukemias. So what, what is the origin of leukemia? It has been hypothesized that either a hematopoietic stem cell or a hematopoietic progenitor will be, have one, two, or more oncogenic events that will give rise to a leukemia stem cell. This leukemia stem cell also has a capacity to self-renew and give rise to progenitors, this, in this case, leukemic progenitors, which in turn will give rise to the leukemic blast. But what I want you to think is not where leukemia comes from. What I want you to think is how heterogeneous leukemia is. So in a single patient, you're gonna have leukemic blasts, leukemic progenitors, and leukemic stem cells. And the problem becomes then, when you look at the outcomes of patients with AML or acute myelogenous leukemia, which is what I would like you to focus on because this is a big problem and that's the reason we work on AML. So in the, in the past 40 years, you can see that the outcomes of AML are really poor and they have not changed at all. Uh, you can see in 1973 and 2002, 2008, the curves are pretty much on top of each other. Uh, in patients over 55 years old. So, and the reason is not because uh, the therapy doesn't work, it's the reason is because standard of care works in the sense that most patients with AML, when they go to standard induction, they will go into remission. So around 85% of patients that get, get chemotherapy will achieve complete remission. The problem is that most of these patients are going to relapse very rapidly and then die of disease. So that's what the outcomes are always poor, and that's what the therapy has not changed because there is nothing so far that is better than that 85%. And the reason we like to think is because this, again, this heterogeneity on the cells. What happens is the patient comes with AML and then undergoes current standard of care and we know that there's disease left behind, and we like to call that minimal residual disease. And it's minimal residual disease because we know it's there, and in many cases it's very hard to detect, unless we can track a mutation and other um, features of that particular leukemia, but most of the cases, this is still a black box, but we know there's disease left behind. Why? Because the patient relapses. We would like to think that the reason that the patient relapses is because there are leukemia stem cells left behind, which again has had the capacity to self-renew and give rise to disease. So um, my focus has <coughs> been to try to find and identify differences between a leukemia stem cell and a normal hematopoietic stem cell in order to be able to eliminate leukemia stem cells without harming normal hematopoietic stem cells. So stem cells can be identified by immunophenotype. And I'm here putting the immunophenotype I knew when I started doing this research many, many years ago, which they were pretty much identical. They were defined as C34 positive, C38 negative, HLA-DR negative. So what is the clinical implication? So yes, you tell me all these very nice hypotheses, but is there actually clinical evidence that suggests that this population is important? And the answer is yes. There is many papers that have shown that patients that have higher proportions of C34 positive, CD8 ne neg C38 negative uh, cells in the bone marrow or in the peripheral blood, it always correlates with poor outcomes. So patients do worse if they have high proportions of this population of cells. So why would the high stem cell frequency correlate with poor outcomes? Um, I'm going to show you the experiments we did to, to demonstrate that leukemia stem cells were resistant to chemotherapy, but before um, describing those experiments, I want to briefly describe the assay, just in case uh, people are not familiar with it, uh, which what we do is take bulk leukemia cells, we treat them with cytarabine or whatever drug of choice we, we want, and we stain the cells with an exing in seven days. <coughs> 
So in a cell that is alive and intact, uh, you will have phospholipid a phospholipid in the inner leaflet of the membrane of the cell. And the nucleus uh, and the DNA in the nucleus will be inaccessible because the cell is intact. As the cell starts undergoing apoptosis, what is going to happen is the phosphatidylserine is going to flip to the outside leaflet of the cell, and then an exin can bind to that phosphatidylserine and stain that cell. As the cell continues the process of cell death, then the nucleus becomes uh, available because the cell becomes very permeable, and then 7AD, which is a, a DNA dye, will stain the nucleus, and the cell uh, will know that the cell is dead. So we mark these cells, which are an exit negative, 7 AD negative, as live cells. So what we observe when we take total bulk AML and treat with cytarabin, which is the drug that is used for standard of care, we see that this drug works. We see more than 50% of the cells are actually dying or dead. So the conclusion is, yes, this, this drug is actually working. Uh, however, what happens is if we focus on the leukemia stem cell population, the final 34 positive, 38 negative population, you see these cells are intact. Most of the cells are not touched by this chemotherapy and therefore are surviving. So why are they surviving? When we look at cells that are more mature, the final 34 positive, 38 positive, and label them with a, a proliferation marker known as KI67, you can see that their cells are proliferating. And in, in contrast, when you look at the leukemia stem cells, 34 positive, 38 negative cells, most of them are quiescent. They are not proliferating. And if you think about the chemotherapy when it was designed, it was designed under the basis that cancer cells grow very rapidly. And that the best way to eliminate this cancer was to block their ability to, their, their ability to proliferate. So these cells do not proliferate, therefore they cannot be eliminated by standard of care that targets proliferating cells. So that's nice, however, when we compare the, the quiescence of leukemia stem cell, that's a feature that is shared with hematopoietic stem cells. So both of them are quiescent, so we cannot just pick a drug that will kill quiescent cells, because they will harm normal hematopoietic cells. And as an example, I'm showing you cytarabin, which is the standard of care, which is the worst of all things. It does a pretty bad job of killing leukemia stem cells, and does a decent job at harming uh, normal hematopoietic stem cells. So it cannot discriminate between these two populations, it, uh, and therefore is not a good drug to kill leukemia stem cells. So this was how everything started. Um, over 10 years ago. Um, and now we know more markers that can distinguish a leukemia stem cell from a normal hematopoietic stem cell. And they are all labeled in green are the markers that are found in this in positive in either cell, and in red are, are labeled this, the markers that are absent in either cell. So you can see there are a good number of markers that can distinguish a leukemia stem cell from a normal hematopoietic stem cell and the list will keep growing and growing. However, I have to tell you the disclaimer, which is these will change in patient to patient to patient to patient because we are all different. And leukemia stem cells are also different between patients. So the best way to define a leukemia stem cell will be by function. So what we do in the lab is perform functional assays, which means it evaluates the ability of a leukemia stem cell or a, uh, or a progenitor cell to give rise to progeny. So one of these assays is the colony forming assay. The colony forming assay, what it does, it measures the ability of a progenitor stem cell to give rise to progeny. In the case of hematopoietic cells, what we see will be normal colonies, and in the case of the leukemic cell, we'll see leukemic colonies. And the gold standard assay is what we know as the xenotransplant assay, which will measure stem cell activity. In the case of um, hematopoietic cells, if we inject them in an immunodeficient mice, we will see normal hematopoiesis, normal human hematopoiesis in the mouse. And in the case of leukemia, what we will see is leukemia in this mouse. But the best way to prove that it's indeed a cell that has the ability to self-renew, you have to do serial transplantation. So then you should be able to pre propagate the disease again and again 
and again and again and again forever and ever if you have a stem cell. So um, these are the assays w that we use in the lab. So based on that, uh, then the next thing is can we find molecular features that can identify a leukemia stem cell from a normal hematopoietic stem cell and take advantage of that feature to kill the cell. So we found that feature and that feature <coughs> is NF-kappa-B. NF-kappa-B is a transcription factor that is involved in growth and survival responses in tumors. And the way it works is in a normal cell, NF-kappa B will be found inactive in the cytoplasm of the cell. And it can, maintain B, it, it can be maintained inactive by its inhibitor called I-kappa B alpha. Upon a stimuli that could be many different types of stimuli, like uh, infection, for example, in the case of normal cells, uh, NF-kappa B, uh, I-kappa B alpha will get phosphorylated and then degraded by the proteasome leaving NF-kappa-B free to go to the nucleus and start the transcription of genes involved in survival, proliferation, and inflammation. So that's what NF-kappa-B does. So what we found was that in leukemic stem cells, NF-kappa-B was constitutively activated in the nucleus, shown here by a, a DNA binding assay. And in contrast, normal hematopoietic cells did not have NF-kappa-B constitutively active. When we found this first, uh, we were not surprised that NF-kappa B was constitutively active in AML because it already had been reported to be critical for the survival and proliferation of tumors, many other tumors. But what actually surprised me was when we look at the very primitive quiescent stem cells, NF-kappa B was also constitutively active. So these cells are quiescent, are resting, but yet they have this transcription factor constitutively on. So that led us to think and hypothesize, uh, can we use this unique characteristic to eliminate leukemia stem cells? Can we target NF-kappa B to selectively eliminate leukemia stem cells without harming normal hematopoietic stem cells? So to do this, we turn to plants. And we use this compound called parthenolite, which is derived from a, a plant known as feverfew. And it's called fever few because it has been used for many years to decrease fevers, as its name uh, says. And, but it has other uh, medicinal uses, such as uh, relief migraines, endotoxic shock, and stomach aches, arthritis, asthma, skin rashes, tumors, insect repellent, and so forth and so on. There are many uses which fever few has been listed for in ethnobotany. Chemically, it's a cisquinterpin lactone and it was well known to be a potent inhibitor of NF-kappa B. By now, with all the research we've done and other groups, we know that uh, parthenolite also depletes thiol and has many other targets. But at the time, it was listed as a very potent NF-kappa B inhibitor, so we tried it. <coughs> what we found is when we use NF uh, parthenolite in leukemia stem cells, shown in here, we saw that most of the, the, the leukemia cells from different AML patients, each line represents an AML patient sample, these leukemia stem cells were eliminated with a concentration of five micromolar of parthenolite. In contrast, when we look at normal hematopoietic stem cells, you can see these cells at five micromolar concentration were not affected by this compound. So this demonstrated that parthenolite can very effectively eliminate leukemia stem cells, not harming uh, normal hematopoietic stem cells. But this is just based by phenotype. We also corroborated this uh, using, sorry, the functional assays that I mentioned to you, which first we did the colony forming assays. And you can see that treatment with parthenolite decreased very significantly the ability of uh, leukemia cells to give rise to colonies but did not affect the ability of a normal hematopoietic stem cells to give rise to normal red blood cell colonies and uh, white blood cell colonies. And more importantly, when we treated the cells with parthenolite and then transplanted them into immunodeficient mice to assess the function of these cells, we found that treatment with parthenolite eliminated the ability of these leukemia stem cells to give rise to leukemia but did not affect the ability of normal hematopoietic stem cells to give rise to normal hematopoiesis. So this demonstrated that 
Indeed, parthenolite was a very potent inhibitor of, um, of leukemia stem cell uh, function. We needed to corroborate that uh, the reason that parthenolite worked was because our hypothesis, we wanted to corroborate that we're indeed inhibiting NF-kappa B. So the way which I'm going to show it to you is using immunofluorescence, which in a leukemia stem cell, NF-kappa B will be active in the nucleus, and in this case will be stained with yellow, so you'll see it in the nucleus. And we expect that if we inhibit parthenolite, NF-kappa B should go back to the cytoplasm where it belongs. So what we found is indeed that treatment with parthenolite inhibited effectively NF-kappa B in these leukemia cells. And the other feature that parthenolite did was a very potent induction of reactive oxygen species, in this case measured with a transcription factor known as NRF2. NRF2 in a control cell will be found in the cytoplasm, but if, it, if this ROS uh, signal gets activated, it will go to the nucleus and then will activate transcription. And indeed, parthenolite resulted in activation of NRF2, demonstrated that it's inducing reactive oxygen species. So everything is very nice and beautiful, and we found something that can kill leukemia stem cell. But of course, parthenolite cannot be used in humans as it is. Why? Because it has very poor solubility and bioavailability. Uh, in animal studies, when parthenolide was used at 40 milligrams per kilogram, which is the maximum amount you can solubilize this compound, uh, very low amount was detected in the plasma of these mice, which was 200 nanomolar. So if you remember, I told you we need at least five micromolar to kill leukemia, so this amount will not be useful to treat animals or people. So for those reasons, we started collaborating with Dr. Peter Crooks to make medicinal analogs to parthenolite. And uh, what we found was the MAPT, which is a soluble analog of parthenolite. And I just point out here the timeline. So it, it takes a long time to go through all this process to make a medicinal analog and take it to phase one clinical trials. So the MAPT is right now in clinical trials and we're expecting to see what happened with this compound um, to see if it actually would kill leukemia stem cells in patients. But I, since, since I'm in Ithaca, I will like to talk about the studies we did in dogs um, because I, um, I think this is very interesting and very cool. And, and I think you guys will appreciate it more <laughs> um, than other people. So we use canine leukemias and I have to point out that this is not a leukemia stem cell model. Uh, these were advanced spontaneous CD34 positive leukemias. And at the time that we started this collaboration, which was, was, a, sorry, was a collaboration that was established um, by chance. So what happened is we published the paper with parthenolite, we received a phone call of a vet and said, hey, can we use your compound in dogs? dogs have AML and they died very rapidly of AML. There's nothing for them, can we try it? So we thought that would be cool, but we don't know anything about dog leukemias. We don't even know if NF-kappa B would be active in dog leukemias. So the very first thing we did is tested if NF-kappa B was constitutively active in leukemias of dogs. And the answer was yes, so we did check. And then the second thing, well, would parthenolide work in these dog leukemias in vitro? And the answer was yes. We also tested normal bone marrow from dogs, healthy dogs, and we found that parthenolide was not harmful to normal hematopoiesis of dogs. So with that in hand, we said, okay, let's do it, let's try it, and we tested in three dogs. So the end is very small, but I thought the results were really big and changed how we saw parthenolide for clinical trials. So we're three dogs with advanced CD34 positive leukemias. We treated them with the MAPT, different doses, different schedules, because that dose and schedule was dependent on the, 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 I guess the dog, the size of the dog, and how far the, the vet clinic was. <coughs> and, and also, we, we knew, um, we knew all the pharmacology of uh, the MAPT in dogs because that was a study that was done to take the, the drug to clinical trials. 
So we knew that a dose of 100 milligrams per kilogram was the maximum tolerated dose for the dog. So in, even in that sense, we were lucky we had that information. So, so we took different time points. We collected peripheral blood. We checked the white blood cell counts. We looked at C34 because it was the only marker that we knew. And there are very few markers available for flow cytometry to look at dog cells. And then we also look at our biological markers, of course, NF-kappa-B, and in this case, to measure reactive oxygen species or stress, we use gamma-H2AX. And mainly because it cross-reacted with dog. So uh, what we saw is first, we saw an increase. This is an example of one of the dogs. We saw a very marked increase on white blood cell counts after the treatment with the MAPT, 50 milligrams per kilogram. What we saw too was a decrease in the expression of CD34 positive in these leukemia cells. So this data was suggesting to us that the leukemia cells were differentiating potentially into normal white blood cells before they, 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 they die. And what we observed was indeed the MAPT was causing differentiation of leukemic cells in vivo. And of course, it was inhibiting NF-kappa B in vivo. So um, these pieces of evidence confirm that indeed parthenolide inhibits NF-kappa B, but the surprise to us was that in vivo, in dogs, the MAPT was inducing differentiation rather than just immediate cell death as we saw in vitro. <coughs> This was a major change for how we draw the clinical trial because then we, we thought, you know, maybe it's a good idea to first decrease the white blood cell counts of the patient because you don't want to have um, tumor lysis syndrome in people. We did observe tumor lysis syndrome in one of the dogs. So this was uh, very uh, lucky, I think, for us to be able to treat these animals and be able what happens when you have uh, a spontaneous leukemia where you have dog leukemia in dog microenvironment, which we don't see, of course, in the xenografts. That, that's the part we're missing when we treat xenografts because you have human cells in mouse microenvironment, which is not the same as you see in people. But you might, wanna wa you might wonder what happened with the leukemia stem cells. This was a shot we took in the dark because we don't even know if the animal, if we could do xenografts of dogs. So we said, well, let's just try it. The worst that can happen is that nothing happens. So what we did is took cells from day zero of treatment of this dog, and then day 12 after treatment of the dog. We, we transplanted the cells, equal cell number of leukemia cells, in the mouse at day <coughs> zero, and in the mouse at, from day 12. And we measured the ability uh, of these cells to give rise to leukemia in these mice. And what we found was a significant decrease in the ability of these leukemia cells to give rise to leukemia in the mouse. What we did next is do serial transplantation. Like I told you, the stem cell will be able to recapitulate the disease forever and ever and ever. And what we observed is when we serially transplanted these cells, again, equal cell numbers for dog cells for these mice, we saw a significant decrease. The, the significant decrease was even stronger when uh, the, the cells were serially transplanted. This data strongly suggested that parthenolide was indeed targeting leukemia stem cells uh, in these animals. So, um, so that, that was great, and now we're just waiting to see what happens with the clinical trials with people, and, uh, and it's still undergoing, but we expect to see similar observations. And the endpoints that we're gonna take are gonna be very similar to what we did in the dogs. But this all was very nice, but we're still trying to think if there is better ways to take these compounds that are not soluble, that have very poor pharmacological properties, if there is a way to take them faster to the clinic and closer to where leukemia stem cells reside. So leukemia stem cells live in the bone marrow and they like to hide on top of being chemoresistant and uh, quiescent, they also like to hide. They like to hide in the endosteal region of the, micro, of, the, of the bone marrow, where they're also further protected from chemotherapeutic drugs. 
So what we thought is why we don't take uh, parthenolide as a proof of principle and use nanoparticles to take parthenolide to the bone marrow. So we took parthenolide. Uh, we, uh, it, this was in collaboration with uh, Haif Shen. He is in Houston. Uh, we took this, the parthenolide, we put it in micelles. These micelles are covered with silicon particles. And then these particles are covered with uh, E-selecting thioeptomer. The E-selecting thioeptomer will guide this uh, nanoparticle all the way to the industrial region of the bone marrow as it will like, find E-selecting. And then very slowly they re deliver the drug in that area where the leukemia stem cells reside. So before telling you about um, what happened, I want to compare and contrast how we use the nanoparticles with how we use the soluble compound I tell you about, the DMAPT. So in mice, the half-life of DMAPT is only 30 minutes. And the dose that we thought we had to use to achieve the 5 micromolar concentration is 100 milligrams per kilogram. So we need to give it three times a day, oral gavash, every single day. And just so you get an idea, each syringe represents a dose. So I was a postdoc when I was doing this. I, cannot, I can tell you that was not fun for me or for the mice. Nobody was having fun. Um, but um, the worst part, and I'm not going to show it here, is in another paper we already published, the DMAPT in mice by itself cannot eliminate tumor burden. You need to combine it with another drug, and we think it's because probably the mice produce more glutathione and they prevent the activity of the drug to get to the leukemic cells. So if you combine with an anti with with uh, with mTOR inhibitors, you can potentiate the activity of the MAPT in vivo to kill leukemia in mice. I also show you it works in dogs without any other stuff. So I think, again, the biology of each species is going to be very important. But what was very cool about the nanoparticles is because they are uh, very slow release, we can deliver them once every two weeks uh, via tail pain. And also, we loaded as much as we can load of parthenolide into that micelle, which will represent approximately, assuming that all the parthenolite made it in the animal, will be 2.5 milligrams per kilogram uh, per mouse. So you can see it's a huge difference in dosing. So what we found is that in the nanoparticle, parthenolite was very potent at eliminating total tumor burden when compared with the micelles uh, with parthenolite or with the empty nanoparticle. We also found that was very potently inhibiting NF-kappa B in vivo. And the thing that I found really interesting is when we measured parthenolide either in the plasma or in the bones of these mice, one hour after bolus treatment with these uh, nanoparticles, we found that there was nothing in the plasma and everything was in the bones just in one hour after injecting these nanoparticles, suggesting that these nanoparticles were very effective at bringing parthenolide to the bones. We also did the serial transplantation to demonstrate that we're actually still killing leukemia stem cells, and we saw these are two PDX, meaning two primary AML samples injected into the mice. We showed that the, in serial transplantation, we decreased the ability of leukemia stem cells to give rise to disease. So uh, because all of this part, because of the great activity of parthenolide, because we found it from natural products, we thought that it would be very important to start a collaboration with people that know about plants, that know about chemical, um, uh, the chemical structures, they know about spintropin lactones. So we started a collaboration with the New York Botanical Gardens, with Cornell here, with uh, Dr. Eloy Rodriguez, and with the uh, University of Arkansas. And this collaboration consists in finding plants that are related to fever fuel, to find better cisquintropin lactones that will have similar activity to parthenolide, and that we can take to the clinic, hopefully in a rapid manner, and understand better what are the critical activities of this type of compounds. 
So I hope to we can have more updates uh, soon. But this project is advancing rapidly. So just to switch gears, after we talked all about um, cisquintuprin lactones and, and parthenolide, I would like to briefly mention the work of cranberries. And the reason I want to talk about cranberries is because this work started from a PhD student uh, that came from um, this school. Well, now she's a postdoc in New York, but she did her PhD here at Cornell. Her name is Lori uh, Weistrom. And she loves cranberries. It's her passion. Everything she does, leaves and things, is cranberries. And uh, because uh, Dr. Rodriguez, uh, <laughs> it's true, she brings everything with cranberries. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. Um, <laughs> so, um, and we're all learning to love cranberries too. So uh, she, she came to my lab because Dr. Rodriguez mentioned her, uh, my name, and she wanted to test her extracts in cancers. So I agreed to be her mentor. And uh, she had cranberries, I had leukemic cells, and we said, let's try it. It's a perfect combination. And uh, cranberries, as you all know, they are well known because they are used for urinary tract infections and also can stimulate the immune system. So what we did first is try total cranberry extract in different uh, leukemia cell lines. And this is just an example of all the leukemia cell lines we tested, and you can see that the cranberry extracts are very potent at, at causing cell death in leukemia cells. There is a threshold, like a lower concentration, that you can see some cells are more sensitive than other leukemic cells around here, but the higher you go in the concentration, it seems to work on all leukemia cells. Uh, we also purified, Lori also purified the active, uh, one of the active compounds uh, of the cranberries known as Apex, which are formed from different multimer multimers. It's not, purified, it's not a purified compound, it's a mixture of uh, dimers, trimers, tetramers, and pentamers. And uh, we have also found that individual uh, components are not sufficient to kill the leukemia cells. So this mixture we use at lower concentrations in primary samples and in the colony assays. And you can see that uh, at 62.5 micrograms per milliliter, we can see that leukemia progenitor cell activity is decreased and normal activity of uh, hematopoietic cells is not affected. Uh, we have also done the, uh, the stem cell assays we discussed and we see selectivity against leukemia stem cells, not normal hematopoietic stem cells. And because uh, we wanted to see if she can, because she really, really wanted to try it in vivo, so I said, well, let's try it. So we set up some xenografts. We transplanted primary patient samples in a mouse. We established the xenograft, the xenograft, the animal had leukemia. Uh, she treated either with PBS, cytarabine, or uh, Apex at 25 milligrams per kilogram, two times a week, treat, uh, for three weeks. And what we found is that Apex were really uh, potent at eliminating a tumor cell engraftment almost at the same level as RSC. So this is the standard of care, 60 milligrams per kilogram, which is very toxic to the mice, as in contrast, 25 milligrams uh, per kilogram, which it was not toxic uh, to the animals. So this suggests that these uh, cranberry extracts could be used uh, in a um, in vivo to kill leukemia and hopefully leukemia stem cells. The secondary transplants are underway, so hopefully we can also show it kills leukemia stem cells. So just to summarize, uh, what we discussed today is that compounds derived from medicinal plants, uh, such as parthenolide and cranberry extracts, can be used to target leukemia stem cells. Also, the nanoparticles represent a strategy to deliver compounds uh, with poor pharmacological properties into mice uh, and potentially also to humans, and that other natural products are currently being studied to target leukemia stem cells. In general, what we're doing in the lab is trying to get uh, AML samples, uh, characterize them well from patient to patient, do high throughput assays to evaluate the ability of compounds to kill uh, leukemia stem cells using functional assays, and also develop uh, biomarkers so we can uh, match a drug with a patient. 
And also from the bedside to the bench, when we start the clinical trials, we like to save samples, characterize them well, bank bone marrow, peripheral blood, plasma, so we can do biological assays to determine if we're targeting leukemia stem cells in the patients, and also test the biomarkers to make sure that the drug is doing what it's supposed to do. And just finally, I need to thank the people that have been working so hard on these projects. As first, I want to thank my collaborators on the clinical side, especially Dr. Gail Robos, uh, who is the director of the leukemia program at Cornell. Uh, Dr. Michael Balik is our collaborator at the New York Botanical Gardens and he's been getting us a lot of plants. Uh, Michael Becker at the University of Rochester, he, he provides us uh, also leukemia, leukemia cells. Peter Crooks and Cesar Compadre work on the modification of compounds and the purification of uh, the compounds from plants. Uh, this is my lab. In the summer, it looks busy in the summer, we get a lot of people, students, high schoolers, and undergrads, but it's a lot of fun. And this is the team, so this is Lori, uh, <clears throat> Sabrina, and Bernardo were the pack grant team meaning they work with Apex and cranberries, and they named themselves Pac-Cran. And they had their logo, which was a little Pac-Man shaped, like Pac-Man shaped cranberry eating leukemia themselves. <laughs> so, and then is uh, Gabby, Rachel, she's actually a student here from, Corna from Cornell Ithaca. Uh, Paola, she's from Ecuador. Maria, and uh, Yes, uh, I'm missing one person, uh, uh, um, uh, Gabby, but she's not in this picture. They are from the weeds team. They couldn't come up with a better name, but that means that they focus on the plants like Fever Few and all other uh, medicinal plants we're getting from uh, the New York Botanical Gardens. And this is the funding that, of course, without funding, I would be doing nothing, uh, <laughs> but just thinking about it. Um, and thank you to you for your attention. Have you done any uh, like gene expression or anything with the cells to see if anything besides the NF kappa B is affected with the fever With parthenolite, yeah. we did. So, and we found many other parthenolite like compounds using the gene expression signature of leukemia. And uh, the strongest signature is inhibition of NF kappa B and activation of reactive oxygen species. Uh, we've also done modifications of parthenolide with biotin, so we can pull down its targets. So when we did that, we found that parthenolide has other targets that are involved in metabolism, and that was reported by my previous mentor, Craig Jordan. And other people have also found that can also affect epigenetic machinery. So in general, uh, parthenolide will bind to any protein that will have a free cysteine or any thiol group that is available. Um, so it is not just an nf inhibitor, we use it because of that feature, but it causes many more things. Yes? What is the mechanism for the nanoparticles to move the, the parthenolide into the right place where it can be effective? So it is, it is labeled on the surface of the nanoparticle with an E-selecting uh, thioeptomer. So it's a very tiny peptide that can bind E-selecting. So E-selecting is uh, expressed in the endothelium and is found in very high amounts in the endothelium of the bone marrow. So that's how it, it's guided there. So it's really cool, but it's very expensive. So we're trying to find other ways to take them right there. <laughs> so the DPAMT studies um, in the canine model then induces dif differentiation. So in, in AML then, of course, I mean, differentiation induction therapy has been remarkably ineffective. So those are really exciting results. And I was wondering if you've tried or if anyone has tried to look at, you know, how the DPAMT works in the canine model. It, it doesn't, I presume, work in, in, in the human primaries yet. Uh, no, I mean, that would be very nice, but at the time, 
you know, all, everything happened so fast, like really so fast, that uh, the amount of sales we had, it was not a lot. But, I mean, thinking back, yes, we even discussed this at some point with, with Craig. It would be nice if we had sales left over to see what happened to the sales, what is the signature in the dog sales. But first of all, we had no experience with dogs. We don't know anything about dogs. We were just working with the, with these three animals. So I think, uh, just I was talking to Christy yesterday, I think it's a great opportunity to work um, uh, with dogs and try to understand more about the biology of these compounds in a system where um, hopefully will be more similar to humans, hopefully, maybe, um, at least closer than mice and xenografts. Um, Is it an AHR like ant? I don't know. I don't know. It might be interesting to know if it can potentiate, say, retinoic acid. Yeah, uh, and the thing is because we saw this effect in dogs, not in mice. So even in the mice, when we combine with the mTOR inhibitor and we saw very uh, a significant synergy in the mice, in the xenograft, we never saw differentiation of cells in the mice. So, uh, so the system probably is also important to consider and we've never went back to those studies uh, in dogs. Yes. So you mentioned that um, different patients have a different subset of um, phenotypic markers. Does that change with um, treatment with methanolide, or is that kind of um, stable? Have you so that? that's a very good question for any chemotherapy. So we really don't know, and part of the efforts to try to evaluate minimal residual disease in, uh, involves flow cytometry because. If you think about tracking a population, we need to know how this population behaves. And we cannot assume that the markers are not going to change. My personal point of view, I like to see uh, the phenotypic markers as your dress, as your coat. You decide to wear something today, maybe because your gene expression told you to, but <laughs> it doesn't mean that after you get exposed to some very aggressive chemotherapy and you want to hide from this therapy, maybe your dress is also going to change. Uh, so that's something we want to understand, and we have very strong efforts following and understanding minimal residual disease after any chemotherapy, because probably it's going to be different from patient to patient and from therapy to therapy, but if we can tell what is abnormal, then would be a way to track those cells. I just want to make a comment on sesquiterpene lactose in a review that I did quite a while back. Uh, there were almost, like, almost 2,000 of them known, quite diverse, in primarily in the Asteraceae sunflower mm -hmm. family. And with one of them, they just gave a Nobel Prize for activity in case malaria. The point being that these lactones are, are, we really don't understand how they go about it, but there are certain public force on the molecule that we that we gain attached to proteins. But uh, we're still very far from really understanding mechanistic uh, action on this compound. So they're, right. they're open to an incredible kind of a, a diversity. And I, and I like what you've done because this is what we have to do with, I think, the, says for any kind of any natural product that we're trying to push and, and utilize it, that, you know, as a, as a, as a pharmaceutical. We need really good, rigorous uh, essays, which unfortunately we don't do with a lot of natural products. And I think that's where the, the negative feeling is toward natural products as potential uh, pharmaceuticals, right? Yeah, so that's, uh, I mean, that's the goal of the big collaboration with uh, all this multidisciplinary team we, we set together because. Uh, also, I mean, I didn't mention it, but when I was a postdoc, I tried many different cisquintropin lactones just because we said, oh, let's try uh, anything that we saw that looked like parthenolide. And all of the activities were very different. And when we were screening the, uh, the, the medicinal analogs, they all behaved differently. So the idea is to try to find the most potent cisquintropin lactones that are still selective and try to understand where the selectivity comes from, because probably the targets are not going to be the same, and maybe we will be able to tell, okay, she has to be NF-kappa-B, and what else? 
what is the right combination of the Cisco and Chipping Lightons? Uh, Cesar, my collaborator, you know Cesar, he likes to see it as a melody. He says it's like playing the piano. You have to hit the right keys in order to produce music. And so we want to find what that music is for Cisco and Chipping Lightons and leukemia. Yes? Does variability in the phenotypic markers in untreated disease reflect uh, multiple paths for development of the disease or, or differences among individuals? I think we don't know yet, and I think the more we, know, we are doing sequencing and trying to match sequencing to, to each individual patient, we might be able to understand a little bit more. And also, I mean, I didn't want to mention it, but not to make everything so more complicated because you are all going to get out very depressed after all of this information, is that there is a lot of heterogeneity, even within the heterogeneity I told you, in the tumor, there is still clonal heterogeneity, meaning within the same patient, you're going to have several clones with different mutations. So, when I think about targeting leukemia, leukemia stem cells, we're playing the game whack, whack them all. You hit one and the other one comes out of you and we just try to find how, a huge hammer to get them all down. So, uh, so this, is, this is a problem and probably it's also that heterogeneity that you have in the genotype that will be reflected in the phenotype. And because all of this is evolving so rapidly, maybe we'll very soon have enough information to match the, the search surface signature with that some genetic signature and will help us distinguish them one from the other. Yes? Is there any possibility that when you do the serial transplants, that because everything is so rapidly evolving, that um, like, a, like a leukemia cell that's not a stem cell, can gain more stem cell-like properties and kind of like uh, be a founder for the disease, even though it wasn't originally a leukemia stem cell where it was coming from? Or is that not something that really happens? So this is a hypothesis that people have thought, but not only in the mouse, also in people. So that's what when I told you about the origin of leukemia is that's a hypothesis. We don't know what is the directionality of the cells, which, so the definition of a leukemia stem cell does not mean it's a cell that came from a normal stem cell. It's a cell that acquired the ability to behave like a stem cell. So it could have been a more mature, could have been a blast, but the right combination of genetic modifications or epigenetic modification gave them the capacity to self-renew and give rise to progeny. So yes, the more, and actually there's studies that have shown the more aggressive the tumor becomes, even in patients. So if you take a patient, a diagnosis, and separate C34 positive, C38 negative cells, you can see the hierarchy, as I described to you, works beautifully. The stem cells are the stem cells, and then you have the progeny, et cetera, et cetera. If you take sample from a relapsed patient, the same patient, at relapse, and take the different C34 positive, C38 negative, and then other cells, every cell will behave like a stem cell. So the hierarchy is not maintained in that case, meaning that chemotherapy must have changed something in the process. So that's why we think we need to really catch and kill the cells from the beginning, yeah. or when they are quiescent before they come back. Once they come back, they're a different monster. I think we'll uh, that's a question, and somebody has a real important one. Uh, so, again, thank you very much, Monica. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.